United States and the Marshall Islands enjoy a very close and special relationship. Under the Compact of Free Association, the United States is committed to defend the Marshall Islands as if it were part of the U.S. Marshallese citizens enjoy the privilege of visiting or living in the United States as non-immigrants without a visa. Why, were the, why did the rebellious first start coming to the Marshall Islands? Because to test a bomb. To test a bomb. Interesting. Okay. What year? 1945 was the end of the war. Marshallese are eligible to serve in the U.S. military. Approximately 80 Marshallese citizens are currently serving in the U.S. Armed Forces. Okay, then what happened after uh, the bomb in King? Where did, what did the, what did the rebellion say to the Marshallese? God sent us. They said, God sent us here, right? What else did they say? Mankind. mankind. It says, for the good of mankind, right? For the good of the world. The Marshall Islands is the host of an important U.S. military facility the U.S. Army Kwajalein Atoll's Ronald Reagan Ballistic Missile Defense Test Site. What happened in Rangelak? Oh, oh, the bomb spread out. Oh, so the bomb blew up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. In the shape of what? Snow. 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 A mushroom. A mushroom. A mushroom. A mushroom. The United States and the Marshall Islands have a very close and important economic relationship. Through the recently amended compact, the United States will provide over $57 million per year to the Marshall Islands for the next 20 years. And then the wind blew, it quite blew it over to where? Rumblak. 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 And in Rumblak, it came down and people thought it was snow. 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 And what happens when people are playing in the snow? They got sick, right? Because was it snow? No. no. Undergirding our strong relationship are our close people-to-people -people ties. In addition to the 2,400 some Americans living and working on Kwajalein, American teachers from the Dartmouth volunteer programs are helping to provide educational opportunities for Marshallese children throughout the country. In 1999 spring, um, I went down to Majuro to meet with the then Minister of Education, uh, Justin de Broome, uh, to arrange the program. And my hope was to start a regular winter internship uh, located in Majuro, the capital, um, of maybe um, five, six, seven students per year. And these students, it would be a mentored internship. So these students would teach in the area high school or the middle school and have um, a Dartmouth professor, a Dartmouth instructor, watch them, live with them, supervise them closely. Uh, my intention was to run that for a couple of years in the hope that that would stimulate uh, interest in a graduate program. I got contacted by Tina Stegi through Andrew at Dartmouth wanting to put together this volunteer program. Uh, I thought it was a great idea and really went as far as I could in terms of helping smooth that over and get it going. Um, William Sloan Coffin, the civil rights worker and uh, former chaplain at Yale, says every first uh, world student should have a third world experience. My own philosophy resonates with that. I do it because I want to take generally somewhat privileged students from Dartmouth out of their comfort zones to have them shake up their assumptions about life and culture abroad. Uh, to have them live in much, much more modest circumstances and realize what is requisite for living and life and to expose them to a very interesting culture that has an intricate relationship with the United States. I think that the Dartmouth volunteers have found here in their experience that teachers are really needed in this country, good teachers. is to prepare children to to be able to, when they graduate, to be able to either go on to either it's a high school or maybe even to college, those that go, can go on to college. And we're finding that that means that uh, 
many of the students when they graduate from either eighth grade or even at the high school level are just not prepared. Uh, they're not prepared to go on into the ninth grade and they're not prepared when they come out of the twelfth grade to even go on to further education. So this is one of the major challenges. You know, how do you uh, prepare these students well enough so that they can read and write and you know because English is the uh, the language. Well, the RMI has a long history with the United States. I mean, you know, since 1940, yeah, well, since 1947 when the UN Charter was, you know, U.S. administered the USTTPI for X amount of years, and the RMI has close has a very close relationship with the United States. Half of the people that are educated in the, in the Marshall Islands went to school in the United States. So there's that strong connection. English is the um, language of instruction here. It's what all the documents are written in here. Um, Marshallese is an oral language that the children are brought up in their home, brought here and are, are brought up to learn first in their homes. Um, but it's very much a bilingual culture. Well, I always feel when I go there, whatever the subject matter is, it's really English is being spoken. And it's not so much English as a second language, it's English as a foreign language. Um, there are you know, there are, there are difficulties. You know, a lot of these we inherit from trust territory time. That's, you know, that's when we were not an independent country, but our system of education is patterned after the U.S. And, and that means pretty much, a, you know, big picture of that is English and to be able to handle English. I did it because I wanted to give my Dartmouth students an extraordinary opportunity to learn and develop but I also wanted to do it um, in an area of the world that desperately needs help, as I understood the Marshall Islands did, and because um, they were so receptive to my initial uh, approach to them, and because I was confident that with enthusiastic, bright, liberal arts educated uh, undergraduates and graduates, you could make a significant contribution. say at the moment uh, about 50 percent or more 50 percent of our teachers have high school graduates only is that qualification 
given that the that that many maybe most high school graduates here graduate with a, maybe a sixth or seventh or eighth grade reading ability that comments on the difficulty of having somebody coming straight out of high school going into a classroom as a teacher with very minimal experience and unfortunately that's the situation now with a number of, of schools. The way I look at it now, there's a lot of foreigners are now on measure take away the job from us because they don't have skill. That's why I want to, you know, help this uh, younger to become a good workers in the future. To recruit teachers from out here is really hard. And typically what happened is we would get people who were teaching somewhere else here in the Marshall Islands, sometimes qualified, sometimes not. I mean, I was a Peace Corps volunteer and I had taught school in Outer Islands, but I was not certified to teach school in any way, shape, or form. Living in elementary school, I know that they cancel school sometimes three days a week because teachers don't show up, too many teachers don't show up. I've seen it firsthand because I taught for six years too. It's like, to a lot of these people, especially in the Outer Islands, it's just a glorified babysitting job. It's like, here are the crayons, here's some paper, color for an hour, leave me alone. The problem of dependency in the Marshall Islands is huge, and it's, it goes way beyond a physical dependency on funding or aid. It's a mentality and an attitude. And this developed out of years of the former U.S. Trust Territory Administration when everybody's attitude was basically, well, the government will take care of it. Whatever it is, the government does it. So, it, for example, you will see in, on an island, you will see a church building next to a school. The church will be immaculate, newly painted, everything in order, grounds taken care of, and right next to it, the roof is falling off the school, the, the, the chairs and the tables are all broken, the, the paint uh, job hasn't been renewed in 10 years, and you say, well, you know, it's in your community, what about it? Oh, well, that's the government's job to fix the school. But the church, I mean, if a blade of grass is out, they, it's taken care of the next day. because the U.S. claimed power to govern us. We did not ask for it. But when that happened, we came to understand our choices. After decades of living with the good and bad under American rule, we decided the greater good would be to cast our lot with the U.S. under the Compact of Free Association. You will undoubtedly hear various accounts of events surrounding Bravo. From this long list of stories and anecdotes, you will witness the horror of the bomb, hear the multitude of reason why this or that happened, and draw your own conclusions as to what to believe. Of course, you will hear from the apologists who will try, as they always do, to explain away our suffering and sorrow as byproducts of the Cold War. The accident theorists will tell you about sudden shift of wind 
and stronger yield than expected. Others will write us of as allies just bearing the burden of the Cold War. Local witnesses will tell you, they will tell you of how as children they ran and cried that played in the milky dust that fell on them. They will tell you of confusion, of fear, of thinking that the world had ended. We understand what 4th of July means to American. We understand what Ford's Theater and December 7, 1941 means to America. We understand what November 22, 1963 means to America. And of course, we understand what September 11 will always mean to America and its people. What we are here today to ask is that America understand us as well as we understand it. I want to thank our guests from overseas who have traveled so far to be with us here today to remember and honor the experiences of our citizens during the U.S. nuclear weapons testing program. Survivors endured to rise up from their obstacles and use their strength to persevere. Marshall is our survivors, not victims. You know, at some point we have to really re evaluate and revisit our so-called dependent dependency on the United States to provide everything for us, even teachers and all that. But what I'm saying is that for the next couple of years, we will continue to require U.S. teachers to help us, to empower us, to educate the Marshallese so that then we can expand our and explore other possibilities and other opportunities from other places and eventually will, you know, the, the dependency on, on the U.S. will decline because at the time, then we will have uh, more opportunities, not just from U.S., especially in a world, uh, you know, globalized world just as we have today. Not every student that graduates in the eighth grade goes on to high school simply because we just don't have enough chairs and tables at the high school level. You know. I think the past 20 years or 40 years of however long since the United States was here under the trust territory, the education system didn't really get, uh, wasn't really given the kind of resources and support it needed to really establish itself before the touch territory end. So when the government of the Marshall Islands or the Republic started about 15 years ago, all the infrastructure, the basis of education system, they just weren't in place yet. When school started, the classroom next door, they were still working on it, so there were classes outside. We didn't have desks or chairs. But some of the problem is not just language problem, it's lack of resources, it's lack of textbooks. It's appalling how bad the textbooks are. One of the textbooks I looked at, one of the classrooms last year, Ronald Reagan was president. You know, people say, oh, you got a lot of money, but you know, what come, you know, what's happening? Why aren't, why, why isn't it getting better? Uh, just from my own, you know, just observation and what I've seen in the, in the budget, it's true that, you know, a lot of, time federal money would come to the marshals, but they would come with some strict guidelines because, um, you know, like what work in 
Toledo or Ohio probably doesn't apply to the marshals, but you know, those are the guidelines for us to use. A lot of these federal grants don't allow for those basic needs to happen. You know, these are supposed to come to supplement uh, money that is supposed to be given from within the country to basic education. I can tell you that even in the biggest budget this year, I still don't have money to buy textbooks. Education brings to development is skills that you could have a perfect, you know, economic policy, but when you don't have the manpower and the skill to implement, you know, policy, then you're, you're in a dead end. And this is what happened with RMI. You know, instead of giving us here's all the money you need, here's all the free food you need, I need I would rather have see people come in and teach us. If they would give these money and food to us, come down here and say, here's the money, we're giving you some money, here's how you use it. They teach us how to use it. They educate us. You know, here's the food, here's how you use it. Today, we have people with arthritis, we have people with sugar diabetes, because they gave us, you know, U.S. came down with the food and says, here's all the canned food, here's all pack, pre -pa uh, packed food to you. Now, if we had teachers that come in and teach us in the 50s, in the 60s, that really like strong, I mean, just to came in and replace all the Marshallese teachers really teaches us. If this would happen to them, today we would have a lot of lawyers, we would have a lot of doctors, we would have a lot of, you know, <clears throat> people that would, people that we need today. We'd have all the human resources to have a sustainable lifestyle. Because of the history and the in the what the U.S. the the role that the U.S. has had in the history of the Marshall Islands, that to continue to give the aid is is really important in the form of money, but um, until they really are able to give the people the education in order to use that aid to the best you know to for their best interests and to help themselves, um, I think that it's a waste of money. So I think in some ways that what I'm trying to do is, in a small way, is help what I believe is really be somebody from the United States who, um, you know, from the Dartmouth program, who, who knows about and who recognizes our history here. And I think that is part of why I am here is because I do believe I, I want to be part of that solution. A big part of why we have to be here is because we have We've kind of tried to put a fire out with money, almost, and it's caused problems here. I mean, the the population in the Marshall Islands has grown dramatically because you've taken, by giving all this money to these people, you've given them all this affluence and kind of taken away a lot of the incentives to maybe continue the traditional lifestyle that they may have had 50 or 100 years ago. The, those aren't really options for a lot of people anymore because they just don't have those skills. They don't have, they weren't raised that way. And I think it's unfair for someone to say that that was wrong to do 50 or 60 years ago, so now we have to just drop these people. I think we kind of have a responsibility to not only give them money to develop their uh, culture, to, as their culture tries to get up to speed with the rest of the world in a lot of ways. Uh, but we have to give them a lot of time. You hear a lot of people saying, oh, this Western education coming out to this culture, and what's that doing to the kids? From someone who's lived here a long time, I think the Marshallese culture is very well intact. And the idea, the whole idea of the Marshallese culture is for, if you wanted a logo or a saying or a motto, it would be for a future better life. And to them, right now, that's what a future better life means, is going out, getting a Western education so they can deal with all these Western ideals, because it's a big world out there, and they have to deal with that world in the English language right now. Anytime you bring somebody from outside, uh, there may be, uh, whether we realize it, and, uh, realize it or not, there may be some changes to the custom, but, and the way we do things, but maybe that's for the better. There are a lot of people who come out here, anthropologists and whatnot, that still want to see people rowing around in canoes. The first thing Marshallese people asked for when the United States came here and took over from Japan, they wanted westernized clothes. 
They want to feel part of the rest of the world. They want to be, and that's the only way they, in order to compete with the rest of the world to get donor dollars and, and just to compete with the rest of the world, they have to become part of the world community. And part of that, you know, the big part of that is education. And I think uh, as time goes on and you have these teachers out here, and that, that's, it's sad in a sense to say that, but, you know, back in the States, we're not riding around in covered wagons anymore either. I mean, everything evolves, and, and that's the whole Marshallese culture is geared towards that. You know, you take the good things and try to get rid of the bad things of these other cultures that come in and, and overlay themselves over this culture, but, you know, it's a, it's a struggle. I don't think culture is a stagnant thing. Culture is ever-evolving, and that's what keeps it alive. That's what keeps it important. I think what Marshallese need in terms of their identity is the ability to feel the empowered to shape their culture for themselves, to make their own decisions, um, as opposed to just having it as an assault on on them. And that I and I think education actually helps us to do that. It helps us to to be able to respond, you know, um, and to respond in both with a martially sensibility but also with an understanding of what we're, what we're bringing in and to be able to say, well, that's not something we want, but this is. Culture was what the Marshallese had back at the turn of the century when none of, nobody spoke English and um, followed a subsistence lifestyle. Yes, that was the culture at the turn of the century, but Marshallese culture is now is a very different thing because it's a different it's a different world. We still have a very strong identity. People debate it, but that's what culture is. It's it is. It's, it's people. To, it's for people to debate, and the better able we are to debate, the better educated we are. I think the better off we are. first Americans to go to the Marshall Islands and uh, offer our assistance uh, with education. Uh, the Peace Corps has come, although the Peace Corps had a much broader mandate than we have because they provided assistance in a whole range of activities, including education. I'm absolutely adamant that our students are not arrogant to think that they've got the answers to teaching because, in fact, they've got so much less experience. Uh, but nevertheless, sometimes our students do bring in extra resources, uh, extra bits of material that they brought from the States that are helpful. And so I, th I think there, there's a sort of uh, a mutual benefit for, for both the Marshall Islands teachers and the, other, and, the, and the American teachers. I think they get on well. Uh, I'm always alert to, to the fact that, the, 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 that we mustn't be arrogant, we mustn't be condescending, we, we must be humble and uh, and be willing to learn <laughs> The 
You know, what is our purpose here? What are we trying to do here? What's the greater goal for the Marshallese people? Before I came out here, I definitely had some reservations about what I was doing and how what I was doing might be different or similar to, say, the missionaries coming or sort of what you think of when you think of imperialism. It's a hard experience when you first come here from the United States because so many things kind of seem backward or just wrong or inefficient. And it's easy to get very frustrated with those things. Um, a 60-year-old man here, think about the life that he was born into and then now the, where this society is now. 50 or 60 years ago, you're talking about prior to World War II, the Japanese were still occupying here. There was no, there was no automobiles running up and down the road here in Madro, no airfield. Most people hadn't seen airplanes. No, maybe a limited number of power boats, but certainly people weren't relying on power boats to get around between the atolls. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal the amount of change that's happened in a lifetime here. And when you kind of keep things in that perspective, it's a lot easier, I think, to be understanding um, when things aren't running kind of the way we might think is efficient or right. The type of person that's going to come out here is someone who's open-minded, you know, willing to, willing to understand that they're going to a culture where things don't happen like clockwork. And all these jokes about Marshallese time are true. For me to sort of totally absorb, you know, the, what they call the island lifestyle, which I don't think is an appropriate tag, but, you know, the island lifestyle, you know, that you're supposed to accept uh, is supposed to be one that, you know, things can wait for tomorrow and, uh, you know, don't stress yourself out and things like that. And those are things that I, you know, don't believe in. And I, I don't think I would be doing anybody any favors to have adopted that here. There's like a fine line and I think that everyone who's out here struggles with it. It's like, how much do you try and change and how much do you go with the flow? And like, how much do you sit back and say, okay, this is how they do it here, you know? Like, time isn't the same, you know? Things are gonna start late, like this is gonna happen, like this is just isn't how they teach. And how much do you put your foot down and say, like, this is partly why I'm here, like I'm coming to bring this new like perspective and this isn't okay when you cancel school four days in a row because it's kind of raining or because you're tired or because the ship arrived and you're saying everyone has to unpack it but no one's even going near it, you know? Like, where, I don't know, it's like how culturally sensitive should you be? Like, and how much should you pass judgment on the way things work here and how much should you not? One huge thing that's really difficult about being here is you see all, on Keeley, you see all these adults who don't have jobs and they don't seem to have much to do. And it's really hard coming from America, coming from Dartmouth. Because from my own perspective, I'm thinking they must be bored, or they have no ambition, or their life must be sad. But I don't think it's like that, but I still can't understand what it must be like. And I th I've noticed, I've talked to someone who was running for mayor, and he lives on Madro, and he says, oh, Keeley, it's just coffee, 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 sleep, sleep, sleep. They don't do anything. Buebonado, buebonado, you know? And it's been, that's been really hard to see, and just, um, and you kind of hope that your kids don't end up that way, just from my own, you know, putting my values on what I'm seeing. Thinking the most, the most challenging thing that I face here in the classroom is just the different levels that kids are coming in on. For example, in fourth grade, I have 16 kids. One just started to come to school this year, so he's learning to write his alphabet. And then I have a girl who went to school three years in Arkansas, and kind of their levels trying to reach all them, deciding what level you teach at the majority of the time. Is it with the kids who will, are doing better? Is it more in the middle? Is it kind of helping to bring the lower kids up? Just culturally, Marshallese children are really, really shy. So when I ask them for an answer, they're very reluctant. But once they get comfortable with you, then they'll just kind of spit whatever comes out of there, like whatever's the first thing in their mind. They prepped us for these shy kids that wouldn't talk ever. And like the first day I got in the classroom, they're I mean, the first class I had was my first and second graders, and they were literally climbing the walls, like climbing out the windows. They were hiding under desks, and still are. And so I think I wasn't expecting that. We were sort of presented with this idea of Marshallese children and people as like one uniform thing, which in retrospect, I think I should have questioned that a little bit more. Communication in terms of teaching. 
it's been a pretty big challenge because it's tempting some of half the kids understand you when you speak English and half they do, half of them don't but um, and so it's uh, tempting to speak and then you know that half and you, some a lot of them raise their hand half of them raise their hand and answer and you know those half understand and then there's a the half in the back that don't understand you at all um, and learning how to get across that communication barrier was hard <laughs> At first, I do remember writing back to Jess, our program coordinator, our, my boss, that I was not the teacher that I had uh, sort of dreamed or, or hoped that I would be. And that was it, disillusioning at first. It was frustrating. And so I went through a lot of trying to figure out, you know, is, was this just something that was, you know, that was my style that I wasn't going to be able to do anything about? Or was this something that was so much a part of the kids' style of learning, you know, that their entire history of, you know, all the way through elementary school and high school, that they, uh, they were so used to not being involved that I wasn't gonna be able to do anything about it, I couldn't tell. Part of me feels just like really inadequate sometimes, like, wow, I know my intentions are in the right place, I feel. Um, I'm a pretty, pretty bright guy, I'm trying to do what I can to teach these kids English, but some, of them, some reason it's not sinking in, is it my fault? Maybe it's their fault. Maybe I just need to learn a little bit more about how I'm supposed to be teaching these kids in order for me to be more successful. I have a lot of faith that the younger kids, the work that Elise is doing, Lilegra is doing with first and second graders, that they, that English really is, will be fluent for them. Whereas I think some of the seventh and eighth graders, they just, they, you know, you look at language acquisition, your brain stops being plastic after like age 12. And I think we're reaching the, first, the head start first, second, third graders right now, I think that they will be more successful than maybe the older kids right now. gathering evidence to show that our teachers make a difference in the year-long program. The stuff with the, the undergraduates is much more anecdotal. But the principal of Marshall Islands High School talks about the presence of our Dartmouth undergraduates revitalizing the school. She says it's almost as, soon, it's almost as if when your students come in the winter term, um, everything is reinvigorating, everything is vital. So uh, I think they make a difference to them. and. Um, what is so extraordinary is that the degree to the, whatever venture we come up with, whatever extracurricular activity we come up with that we offer the kids, there's always a full supply of children who want to be involved in it.
last few years as I've gone to and fro Madurai, I thought this would be a wonderful place to direct uh, a Shakespearean play. And that sounds sort of like a, a colonial Brit going to West Africa or something. Uh, but I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, some of that Shakespeare speaks to all cultures, all times, uh, all contexts, and if it can be made accessible, the kids would love participating in a play. I think that everybody can agree with us and with anyone, the impact that the play has done on the community. I thought we could martialize the play i.e. make it relevant to the Marshall Islands culture, not set it in ancient Athens, but set it in the Marshall Islands. Look, look at the audience, and then scream. Oh, oh look, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes, okay. <laughs> but of course, the most... Um, striking aspect of the, uh, the production was rendering it in uh, bilingually so that nearly half the play was in Marshallese. So. Sometimes I just wake up in the, you know, thinking how they're going to come up with their lines and how it's going to happen. You know, it was like a nightmare. Take my hand. <laughs> Take it again. Take it again. Coming. Coming. Coming along. We have more leaves to come. Tomorrow we can catch it more. Yes, okay. Excuse me, Professor. Yeah, excuse me. See my... You what, sorry? Talk to, please talk to Mona. Didn't she say she got the spray from you? Yes. I yeah, can't do all of it. She's in charge of the spray. She's in charge of the spray. Sero have offended Dean Patis and all his men that you have but slumber here while this peasant did appear. And this weak and other team, no more young team but a dream. Jumno, do not drop in. If you pardon, we will win. It was, you know, it is really something that has brought my dream to come through that, you know, children here can learn. And I'd bump into people I didn't know in the supermarket, and they would say, there you are, our Marshall Islands kids can do it, can't they? Since they came, um, most of us, we, we didn't know a lot of things. After they start coming in, we were like, oh, that's, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, that guy's nice. I like the way he teaches. So, I mean, where, where, where can we find 40 young, very committed, energetic, smart, obviously, you know, well-prepared, intelligent, young people who, who are ready to spend their time in the classrooms and, and in the schools. We've, we've been really lucky, I think, that you know we were able to get the programs to come over here and to commit. It's better if we have uh, rebellion this year because they're, they're bring uh, their ideas and share with us so we could understand the world. You go around 
and everybody who's affected by the Dartmouth program, whether it's the parents, the kids, the teachers, the local government, the teachers themselves, uh, Dartmouth uh, College, no matter who you look at, the community in general, everybody benefits. There's no unhappy customers here. Everybody who's involved in this benefits. That's why it's so great. That's why it works now. That's why it's going to work in the future. My work is worthwhile here. Um, and yeah, I have a lot of hope and that I, and if I can even just contribute kind of, it sounds kind of cliche, but just in a little way to moving things forward, then, then it's worth my while. Could the Marshall Islands uh, be self-sufficient in 20 years? My opinion, I don't think so. I don't think it could happen unless a uh, very, um, Unless uh, the, the education system is robust, uh, the government structures its uh, uh, economy so that private sector, there's a conducive environment for private sector growth. Let private sector uh, take the lead so that it could create jobs. Get the government to shift its policy from revenue generation to job creation. Um, and try to bring the unemployment rate down from 31% to a more reasonable level. But if we're unable to do all of these things and cut down you know, the population growth and provide these uh, basic services like education, then it's going to be very difficult to do that. We cannot turn back the clock and change the events of the, co of the Cold War that resulted in the contaminations of our lands and radiological images for our people. What we can do and are doing, however, is taking charge of our future. Well, you know, for a while and for a couple of years to come, we will continue to rely on outside qualified teachers to help us. But eventually, marginalists will have to teach themselves to be good teachers but because of the urgency of the situation now, because of the immediate need to have our people start getting back on the right track, we will continue to have, for the foreseeable future, uh, we'll continue to require teachers from uh, overseas, and Tarmouth and uh, other programs are very important to the Marshall Islands.